right, so how many of you guys have you ever sort of grown up with the belief that God changed his method of salvation from the Old Testament to the New Testament? Yeah? It's kind of the, the, the easy answer that we're given, right? And it's, it's not that that's totally wrong, because to pose that question, it, there's a lot of implicit questions within it, and it's not an easy answer. Did God change his method of salvation, or did he not? Um, and so we kind of accept that, that, uh, that answer. But tonight we have to remember that we're going through Romans, and we have to remember that Romans was written to a church that was split basically in half between Jewish Christians and Roman Christians, Gentile Christians. And so in this passage, Romans chapter 4, you can go ahead and turn there if you would like, um, we know that Paul is very specifically talking to the Jewish Christians. Because if you look at verse 1, it says, What shall we say then was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Paul was a Jew. He's speaking directly to the Jewish Christians at this point. And so at this point, we have to realize the, the mindset of the Jewish Christians as they're reading through up to this point in Romans chapter 4. Paul said some pretty, uh, pretty, pretty uh, big things to the Jews, right? Some things that may, might make them like bristle up a little bit, right? right? He, he claimed that the law was powerless to save. That was, that's big, right? And then he claimed that all are deserving of God's wrath, right? In and, and Romans chapter 2, no matter if you were the, the most upright, the most righteous pillar of faith Jew, or whether you're just the, the most downright, dirty, sinning Gentile in the world, it, all are deserving of God's wrath. That would have made some hairs bristle a little bit too. Um, and then, then he, he talked to the Jews and he told them that they put too much hope in their circumcision, and then he told them that they, they put too much hope in their intellect of who God is and of God's law. And so then the last two passages that we've heard from, Paul lays out the foundations of the gospel, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Justification from sins comes through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And those who receive this justification receive it through faith. And that's where we're at tonight. And so at this point, Paul is anticipating a couple questions, being a Jew himself, he's anticipating a couple questions to come from the party of the Jews. And these questions kind of center around one main question, but these questions are, okay, well, what about Abraham? He kind of knows they're going to bring up Abraham, the father of the Jews. And so it's like, well, he's, he's kind of answering these questions of whether Abraham, well, what about Abraham? Was he... Was he saved according to his circumcision? Was Abraham saved according to the law? Was Abraham saved according to his works, according to his deeds? And all of these questions kind of center around one main question that's not stated, but it's almost as if the Jews are asking, why did God change his methods? Or did he change his methods? And Paul is answering that tonight. And hopefully through this passage, we can shed a little bit of light on that for us tonight. And so jumping in here, Romans chapter 4, Paul starts with Abraham, being the pillar of Judaism, being the, the father of the Jews, he starts with Abraham to prove his justification through faith. So it says, what, what then shall we say was gained by, the by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's kind of the big, the big point in this section here. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessings of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. And then Paul quotes from the Psalms written by David, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. And so our first point for tonight is that Abraham was pronounced righteous by faith, not by works. And to prove this, Paul uh, draws upon two of the biggest figures in Jewish history. Abraham, the father of the Jews, the dude that everybody looked at, I mean, he was like, he was the stud of the Jews, and so it's like, everybody looked at him. And then on the other side, we got King David, the most righteous king, the greatest king in all of Israel, the greatest king there ever was in Israel, and the Bible even describes him as a man after God's own heart. And so he uses these two men as an example to show that righteousness comes through faith. 
And so first he looks at Abraham and he says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Now, we have to remember that the Jews had a contemporary mindset that Abraham was justified because of his deeds, because of his good works. And so he's saying here that he was not justified by works, otherwise he would have something to boast about, but not before God. No one can, has anything to boast for before God. There's three, he says, for what does the scripture say? And then he quotes all the way back to Genesis chapter 15, 6, quoting the Hebrew Bible. He says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so Paul is quoting all the way back from the Old Testament and he's not reinterpreting, but he's simply giving a correct interpretation to the Hebrew Bible. He's saying, you guys kind of had this wrong a little bit back then. He's saying, this is actually how Abraham was counted righteous. He believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham was justified by faith, not by works. So he's building a new and a correct foundation of theology. And then he jumps in, and he starts talking about David. Quotes from David, says, Just as David also speaks of the blessings of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. He's quoting from the Psalms here. And at this point in Romans, Paul has done something very particular here, very specific. And the Jews would have definitely caught on to it. He has quoted from and, and shown that righteousness comes through faith from all three major divisions of the Hebrew Bible. So here in, in Genesis, we see the division of the Hebrew Bible of the law. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And then he quotes from Psalms, which was from the division of the writings. Psalms written by David, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. David didn't, didn't get his sins forgiven because of how hard he worked, but because God forgave him. And then back in Romans 1, he quotes from Habakkuk 2.4, if you guys remember. The righteous shall live by faith, Habakkuk 2.4, from the Hebrew division of the prophets. And so Paul is clearly making a statement here, showing that even from the Hebrew Bible that this has been God's method of salvation for humanity. What Paul is saying is that God has always dealt with man in one way, righteousness by faith. Abraham was justified by faith, not by works. And so I want to point out a couple things really quick before we move on to this next section. We have to remember, right, that there is, there is a balance of faith and works, right? Right? I mean, we know that. We wouldn't have the rest of the Bible if all it was was just faith, and then that's all you have, just intellect, right? Just intellectual knowledge. If that's all it was, we wouldn't have the rest of Scripture. We wouldn't need it. So we remember that there's a balance, but we have to also remember that Paul isn't talking about how, or Paul is talking about how we are saved. In this passage, he's talking about how we are credited righteousness. He's not talking about how we know we are saved, like we might see in, in passages like 1 John, encouragement to believers, those who walk in the light are, are in the light, and this is how we know we will, save, you know we will be saved, like good fruit, good tree bears good fruit, right? He's also not talking about um, the validity of faith, true faith, like James talks about in, in James. <laughs> Paul is addressing, so kind of two main differences here is that Paul is addressing an audience here who believes in faith by works. Whereas the difference with James, faith without works is dead, James is addressing an audience who has, become, who has become lazy and started to excuse their lack of deeds with a faulty theology of grace. And so James, when he talks about Abraham, that's the reason I bring this up, because James also talks about Abraham, saying that Abraham was justified by his faith and that his faith was completed by his works. And so we have to remember context here and who each kind of book of the Bible is talking to. And the next thing I want to point out is just the definition of faith. We say faith a lot, but sometimes I kind of wonder if we really know what it means. Um, so the word faith is actually, in our Bibles, it's actually transliterated. So a new word was created in the English language for faith, kind of like baptize or baptism. The, like the Greek word for baptize would mean uh, just immerse or immersion, and so we didn't have a word that really fit that perfectly, and so a new word was created, baptize or baptism. And so faith is the same way. It's transliterated. And Old Testamently speaking, what faith means is to be firm or to be true, to be sure or to be immovable or to be trustworthy. And so when we talk about Abraham having faith, 
And because of his faith being counted to him as righteousness, it wasn't about how strong or, or how big or, or how much faith Abraham had. It was about the object of his faith. His faith was in God. It was, in, it was based in the immovability and the trustworthiness of God. And you see, that's, the, that's the, the principle that Jesus was trying to teach when he was talking about the faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains, right? It's kind of like, what, what does that mean? How does a mustard seed move mountains? And many times I think we, we look at that passage and we think, oh, well, I, I guess I just, I guess my faith is tinier than a mustard seed, right? I don't know what's tinier than a mustard seed. They're pretty small. But I guess my faith is even smaller than that because I don't have faith to move mountains. But that's not the principle Jesus was trying to teach. The principle he was trying to teach is that it is not how much faith we have. It is the object of our faith. The immovability and the trustworthiness of God. And that's the faith that Abraham had. He believed God and it was credited him to, as righteousness. And so faith is not simply intellectual belief. It is belief that guides our actions, right? Case in point, if we remember the story of Abraham, God called him to, to leave his homeland, leave his family, and, and go off into a new land that God would give to him. How do we know that Abraham believed God? Because he did it, right? So his faith, the, the validity of his faith was proven by the fact that he lived his life based on the fact that the statements of God were true. And that is faith because he followed what God told him to do. And so, so from this mindset, the, the Jews thinking that Abraham was, was justified by his good deeds, his good deeds, his obedience to the divine commandments were the fruit of his unquestioning belief, his unquestioning faith in God. So Abraham believed God. He set off for the promised land. Faith or belief comes first, right? And the validity of that faith is shown through the producing of good works, which brings us back to verse 3, which is the point of our first section here. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham was justified by faith, not by works. And in the same way today, we are justified by faith, not by works, because God has always dealt with humanity in this same way. Moving on into our next section, verses 9 through 12. We'll read it. It says, Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? If or It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith, while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that the righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. And so this brings us to our next point, is that Abraham was counted righteous by faith, not by circumcision. Now, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on this, on this section because we've kind of already talked about circumcision and how it doesn't save you, right? But, uh, and, and ultimately, nobody really likes to talk about circumcision that much anyways. But if you do like to talk about circumcision and want to know how that's done and stuff, talk to Andy afterwards. <laughs> after that. He's going to be really happy with me for that. Not now. All right, so we know that the Jews put too much faith in their circumcision, right? We, we know this. Paul is now correcting their faulty theology and, and because they may have had a thought that, okay, so Abraham was saved because of his circumcision, because of the sign of circumcision, right? And then they would have said, okay, and then we are from the lineage, the flesh of Abraham, and we are circumcised, and then we are saved also. And so Paul is correcting their faulty theology, telling them that their circumcision is a sign and a seal. If you look at verse 11, it says, He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So pay attention to the wording there. Let's read it again. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he already, I'll add that in there, that he already had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. And so Paul is saying, the sign of circumcision was given to him after he had already had righteousness counted to him because of his faith, right? And in fact, we know from Genesis and the time that he, uh, that he was pronounced in Genesis 15, 6, that 
he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And then the time that God gave him the sign of circumcision, we know that that was a period of at least 14 years. So Paul is pretty clearly saying, you know what? Abraham was counted righteous by faith, not by circumcision. And he says, another thing to point out here is in verse 11, it says, the sign of circumcision is a seal of righteousness. So the circumcision was not like your member ticket to heaven. It was a sign and a seal of what had already happened inside of you. You were already counted righteous because of your faith. And just kind of a quick side note that the sign or the seal of righteousness of salvation for us today is the Holy Spirit. Um, there's lots of other verses on this, but I want to just read this one. It says, 2 Corinthians, well, 2 Corinthians 1.22, it says, And who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The Holy Spirit is the believer's sign and seal. And so God's sign and seal of salvation has changed, but, his, but his, his means of salvation has not. God has always dealt with humanity in the same way, righteousness by faith. So verses 11 and 12, starting at kind of second half of 11, says the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. All right, so it's kind of back and forth a lot, right? But Paul is, again, he's not, he's not reinterpreting. He's giving a correct interpretation to the promise given to Abraham, more in the sense of giving it its correct interpretation. So Abraham's offspring, like the promise, right, that your offspring will be many, the promise does not simply refer to his flesh and blood, Though it's through Abraham's flesh and blood offspring that the Messiah would come, it refers to all who believe in faith, walking in the footsteps of faith as Abraham did. All right, moving on. Again, you want more on that? Talk to Andy. Um, moving on to our next section, verses 13 through 17. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it has the adherents of the law... Who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith. Key phrase there. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all of his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So this next section here is that Abraham was counted as righteous, not by the law. Counted as righteous by faith, not the law. So again, many Jews had the misconception that Abraham uh, was counted righteous because of his deeds, and maybe they kind of thought it was because a little bit of the, like God's law before it was actually the law. Um, but Paul is saying that's not the case here, right? He's saying that if the promise to Abraham was dependent on the law, it would have stated so in its original terms, and it doesn't. The law, when it was given to Moses 430 years later, it did, it did say that there would be blessings to those who follow and curses to those who broke it, but... That's, that's, just, that's just how it was. It wasn't, it wasn't that salvation was, or wasn't that the law was necessary for salvation. It never said that. And so Paul is saying here in verse 14, it says, For if it has adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. Um, again, he's restating this kind of just in a different way, right? Um, for adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression kind of a weird concept, what he's talking about. Where there's law, is no law, there is no transgression, right? But Paul is just kind of stating the same thing in a different way here. He's saying, you know, the law brings wrath, inevitably. Overall, the law always brought wrath because no one is righteous, no, not one. Nobody can obtain righteousness through the law because no one can uphold it perfectly, right? And so overall, the, raw, the law, maybe it brings some blessings sometimes to those who follow, but overall, all it does is bring curses because nobody can follow it. And so he's just kind of stating this again just in a different way. But then here's the key, the key catch here. Verse 16, that is why it depends on faith. That is why it depends on faith. It has to be, depend on faith. Righteousness has to depend on faith because if it depended on the law, none of us would, none of us would be called righteous. None of us would obtain salvation. So it says, 
That is why they depend on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all of his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So here he states that Abraham is the father of us all, not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles as well, all who believe. Now, Paul in Galatians, in a different passage, had stated that the law was not conditional for salvation, and he kind of is, is stating this this again as well, right? The law brings wrath. The promise comes by faith and is based on grace, which then guarantees the fulfillment of that promise in Genesis to Abraham, as opposed to God giving man based on what he has done, which would be wrath, right? And ultimately, that's why Paul references Abraham and David, because we know Abraham and David, though great men of God, they sinned. They messed up. David messed up big, right? But that's why it has to depend on faith. Righteousness has to depend on faith. Verse 16, key verse there, key verse there. And so following into verse 17, we see the nature of Abraham's faith. This is a cool verse here. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So the God in whom Abraham believed is the God of Resurrection, who gives life to the dead, and the God of creation, calls into existence the things that do not exist. Guys, the same God that Abraham put his faith in and believed in is the same God that we believe in and put our faith in today. The same way that Abraham was counted righteous is the same way that we are counted righteous today. Righteousness through faith. God has always dealt with humanity in this way. Righteousness by faith. And so, moving on into our next section here, verses 18 through 25, and I know we're kind of going fast. It's a big passage. I don't have two hours to talk to you guys, but sorry, it's, it's just an overview. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification." And so our last point here tonight is that Abraham, being justified by faith, is a model for all believers who put their trust in God today. But with that being said, um, kind of take a look at Abraham, right? We know that he was a stand-up dude. We know that he was a Jew of all Jews, right? Of what uh, the the Jews, he was just like, he was the father of the Jews, right? He followed God. he, He trusted God. He did some things. He left his homeland did some things that probably most of us wouldn't do if God called us to do it. He had amazing trust, amazing faith, but he had times of doubt, right? He had times when he didn't trust God. He had times when he sinned. You see, that's why I think that he's a model for us who believe today. Ultimately, all, the, all of these biblical characters that we find in the Bible, a lot of times we try to make them out to be like saints, like, like super Christians, right? Right? In some ways they are, right? But ultimately what we see in the Bible is humanity. We see godly men and women who mess up. We see godly men and women who who doubt, who have times when they don't trust God as much as they should. And ultimately we see the humanity of these, you know, kind of biblical superheroes, but that's why they're a model for us today. Verse 24 says, These words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. And that's why he is a model for us today. My friends, that's that's the life of a believer, right? It's humanity. We live in a balance between, between the flesh and the spirit, right? We've been changed by God. We have the Holy Spirit. We're able to to choose righteousness and to choose not to sin because God has told us that he won't give us a temptation beyond what we can bear. So we know that we have the ability to choose not to sin, and yet we still do sometimes. But that's the balance of of living in a sinful world until we are glorified in heaven with Jesus someday. 
So verse 24, it will be counted to us who believe in him who was raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Guys, the same way that Abraham was counted righteous, the same way that Abraham was given justification is the same way that we receive that today. God hasn't changed his methods of how he deals with humanity. God hasn't changed throughout the ages. He didn't change his mind at the Old Testament to the New Testament. And I know that the question that I kind of posed at the beginning, you know, did God change any of his methods? It's, it's a big question with a lot of answers and not all of them I have. But I hope that I've been able to shed a little bit of light from this passage, from what Paul's saying, about how God has always dealt with humanity in the same way, righteousness by faith. And so let us, let's pray and then let's worship Let's worship one more time to the God of resurrection and of creation. Let's pray. Dear Lord, God, we thank you so much for everything that you've given us. We thank you for your kindness and your love. And we also thank you for your justice, God. Lord, I pray today that we would realize that there is nothing that we can do to earn righteousness. That there's nothing that we can do to earn salvation, but that you have chosen to give it to us freely for those of us who have faith in you. And God, I pray that we would not just remain in mere intellect, but that we would push forward and show the fruits of our faith by following you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.